on my screen and find it. Let me pull up our lab manual. All right, so for <clears throat> the physiology information for this portion is gonna come from our Engage lab manual. All right, so here's the Engage lab manual. I'm just gonna go down it and then we're gonna stop with our physiology talk at the end of the female system at these graphs dealing with the, the female reproductive cycle, all right? All right, so in the reproductive system, both male and female, we have primary and secondary sexual organs that we're gonna be learning. Um, and so the primary sexual organs are going to be the organs that are involved in the production of the gametes. So everybody knows that males produce sperm in the testicles, uh, females produce the eggs and the ovaries kind of know that. So the end result, as we all know, of uh, the combination of a male sperm cell and a female egg cell at what we call fertilization is the formation of a zygote, a single cell that then divides many, many, many trillions times to produce a new individual. So the goal of reproduction is to make a new individual. We know that. Our goal today is to understand at least some of the structures, what they do for reproduction purposes, um, what they are, and you're going to see some of these names when you go to identify them on the models. So <clears throat> technically at puberty is where we begin sexual maturation. And what that means is, is that we then have the ability to start producing gametes in order for reproduction to occur, to make a new individual. So that happens from puberty on. Now the male have the testicles. We say testis, singular, testes, plural, obviously involved in producing the sperm cells, which are called spermatozoa. Now, the process of the production of sperm cells is called spermatogenesis. It's regulated based on hormones. And we're going to revisit a few of these hormones. So spermatogenesis is going to begin at puberty. And so males then for the rest of their life can produce sperm cells. That's different for the female. Females only have a certain number of years that they're able to produce the eggs. So their reproductive years actually end at what you probably know of as already as menopause. And I'll mention some of that later on. The secondary sexual organs include the areas where the sperm cells are going to be disseminated out of the male reproductive system or stored in the male reproductive system, along with some glands that produce, sexual glands that produce products that are important for the survival of sperm cells and for them to have the ability to fertilize an egg. So let's just start with number one. The epididymis is a highly coiled tube that lies on the outside of the testicle, on top of it, and, and it is a storage place for sperm cells. They finish their maturation process. After they're made, they have to mature and they maturate in the epididymis. So sperm cells then, once they're mature, upon male ejaculation, the sperm cells are gonna be forced out of this tube and go into this tube, the vas deferens. The vas deferens is the final tube that leaves the epididymis. And then, as you know, the testicles are on the outside of the body that tube goes up a special cord to enter the body 
And the vas deferens then carries the sperm cells to what's called an ejaculatory duct, which is a tiny little duct that connects the vas deferens to the urethra. Now the urethra in the male is actually used in both the urinary system and the reproductive system. It's different for a female. The female urethra is only used in the urinary system. But when the sperm cells are being transported through the vas deferens and then through the ejaculatory duct into the urethra, the urethra then has the job of expelling the, the sperm, really what we call semen, the ejaculate out of the male body, out of the penis. So all of these tubes are carrying sperm and then the, the secretions from several glands, including the seminal vesicles. The seminal vesicles are paired glands. They lie, they're the largest of the male sexual glands, by the way. They lie on the posterior aspect of the urinary bladder. These seminal vesicles produce about 60% of the volume of semen. Now, semen, the ejaculate, is more than just sperm cells. It's sperm cells along with the secretions from these glands. And I'll, I'll show you the little paragraph where I want you to know about these glands in a minute. So the male has a pair of seminal vesicles. They're on the posterior side of the bladder urinary bladder. The male has a single prostate gland. It's shaped like a donut and it surrounds the urethra just below the bladder. So the prostate gland <clears throat> along with the, the seminal vesicles and the cowper's gland, which are paired, these glands are also called the bulbo-urethral gland. You see two names there. So on the test, you can write either one and know both names. Those three sets of glands produce secretory products that are ejaculated during the male orgasm along with, with sperm cells and collectively it's called semen. The penis is a secondary organ that is involved in transporting semen ultimately into the female reproductive tract. And in that way, if the female is ovulating, sperm cells may find their way to where the egg's at, which we'll find out where that's at in a minute, and then fertilize the egg. Now, the scrotum is considered a secondary sexual org, uh, organ in the male because it's on the outside of the body. It is uh, the sac that houses and protects the testicles on the outside of the body. Now, does anybody know why the testicles are on the outside of the body, but the analogous gonad in the female, the ovaries, the ovaries on the inside of the female body. Why would the this testicles have to be on the outside of the body? Do you guys know this already? I take the silence as a no. <laughs> All right. So ultimately the testicles are housed on the outside of the body because the production of sperm is very sensitive to temperature changes. The internal body temperature is actually too hot for the development of sperm. They become deformed if the temperature is too hot. Same thing if it's too cold. So there are special little muscles that can raise the testicles to and from the body on the outside. So if it gets too cold, those muscles contract and raises the testicle up to the body to warm it up. If it's getting too hot, those muscles relax and the testicles are lowered a little bit away from the body. In that way, raising and lowering the testicles to and from the body can regulate the temperature of the testicle a little bit better at the range, which is just below the internal body temperature for the normal development of sperm. It's kind of crazy. You see, egg cells don't have that problem. So the ovaries are housed on the inside of the female body. Now, secondary sexual characteristics are the body changes that we go through at puberty. So everybody's going through puberty. We know some of the changes already. You change your body size changes, you know, uh, hair distribution patterns are different in males and females. 
voices typically are deeper in males, a little bit more higher pitched in females, and reproductive organs increase in size. So um, all of these changes are going to occur because of a barrage of hormones, sexual hormones, that will start to be produced at higher concentrations at the age of puberty, which happens can happen kind of early, earlier in females, a little bit later in boys, but right around your preteen going into your teens. So we all know that, all right? I'm not gonna ask you that the years there, but we all know when you go through puberty as you're approaching preteen and into the teenage year. Um, and that allows for the body to change so that another individual will know that that person is sexually mature and ready to reproduce. That's pretty much why we have these body changes that occur, right? All right, now let's talk about the muscles here for a second. If you look in this little paragraph, there are several layers that surround a testicle. You'll probably be identifying a few of those layers, which are called tunics on a picture. But when you look at the male reproductive model, I have in, 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 the, uh, in the Quizlet, I have this muscle right here, the chromaster muscle, identified on a model. These are bands of muscle tissue that wrap around the testicle on the inside of the scrotum that contract and relax in order to raise and lower the testicles to and from the body because of that temperature difference that I was mentioning before for optimal sperm production. So that's the muscle that's involved in raising and lowering the testicles, all right? Now, if we look at a testicle in cross-section, and I'll pull up one of the slides in a minute, but if we pull up a, a, a look at a testicle in cross-section, the testicle is made up of a whole bunch of little tubes. Those tubes on the outer perimeter of the testicle are called seminiferous tubules, and they are isolated within little lobules. Those lobules are separated by inward projections called septa. So inside of each one of these lobules are these seminiferous tubules. So it's a big, long, highly coiled tube, whole bunch of them in there. These seminiferous tubules contain the cells that will produce the sperm cells, but they also contain other cells that aid in the process of sperm production. So the, the cells that are involved in producing sperm cells are called spermatogenic cells. Spermatogenic cells. And the cells that help in sperm production or aid these cells into undergoing mitosis are sustentacular cells or cells called serotoli cells. So these are helper cells, right? Now the spermatogenic cells in the male undergo mitosis and meiosis. And there's a spermatogenic cell when it undergoes mitosis, basically it clones itself. If y'all remember mitosis and meiosis from general biology. So mitosis is cell cloning. It's a cell division event that produces an identical cell. So since those stem cells, these spermatogenic cells can undergo mitosis, the male never runs out of the cells that produce sperm cells for his entire life. Now sperm counts do go down. They can get lower as a male get older, as males get older because of the decrease in the hormone levels. But nonetheless, they can still produce sperm late in their life. So they produce, they undergo mitosis, so they clone themselves and we never run, the males never run out of them. However, they also undergo meiosis. Meiosis in the male and the female is what produces the gamete. So it's not my goal to go through all the steps of mitosis and meiosis again, but I do have to mention 
a little bit about them, all right? So ultimately, the cells that produce the gametes, in this case, the sperm cells, start off being diploid. If you remember that, diploid means that the cell has two complete sets of chromosomes. Ultimately, once they go through meiotic divisions and the process of spermatogenesis is occurring, the cells divide to reduce the number of chromosomes by half, in which case the gametes are said to be haploid. So I don't know if you remember, but every cell in your body, except for mature red blood cells and the gametes, have 46 chromosomes. You get 23 chromosomes from mom that came in the egg and 23 chromosomes from dad that comes in a sperm cell. So ultimately, these spermatogonium cells, as they're called, are diploid. And once they undergo meiosis and divide, they reduce the number of chromosomes to 23, right? Now, ultimately, the sustentacular cells are supportive cells. They also nourish the developing immature sperm cells, which are called spermatozoa. These cells ultimately will mature into a mature sperm cell that has a flagellum on it, the only flagellated cell in the human body, so that the sperm cell can swim. Now, we do have cells on the outside of the testicle that I want you to know. I mean, on the outside of the spermato uh, seminiferous tubule. So the cells that lie on the outside of the seminiferous tubule on the inside of the testicle are called the interstitial cells of Leydig or just cells of Leydig. They're also called the interstitial endocrinocytes. Now we learned these a while back when we did the hormone chapter, but I want you to know them again. So where does testosterone come from in the testicle? The testicles make testosterone, you guys know that. It comes from these cells, the interstitial endocrinocytes or the interstitial cells of Leydig. So these are the cells that make testosterone. Now, once the sperm cells are produced, they're immature, they actually have to grow a tail and then they have a little bit more development that has to go on before they have the ability to fertilize an egg. And so they're transported to the epididymis. And in the epididymis, which is a highly coiled tube that lies just on the outside of the testicle, but still in the scrotum, the, the sperm cells stay there for about 20 days or so while they are, while they complete their maturation. And when the sperm cells are completely mature, they then can leave the epididymis upon male ejaculation and then combine with the secretions from the male sexual glands, the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbourethral glands. Right, And all of that is a compilation of what we call semen that becomes the ejaculate during a male orgasm. So the sperm cells, once they're made in the seminiferous tubules, they don't have the capability to fertilize an egg yet. That's why it takes a little bit longer for them to mature and they mature in the epididymis, right? So does anybody have any questions about that? All right. Well, let's move on to this secondary uh, male sexual organ, the penis. Obviously it's involved in disseminating sperm cells, really the ejaculate in the female reproductive tract, right? There's a few things that you're gonna have to be able to identify on the models from the penis, and I'll pull one of them up. But um, ultimately the penis becomes erect during sexual arousal, and you need to know those erectile tissues. The erectile tissues fill up with blood to form the erection uh, of, of the penis, and it's controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. 
So during male arousal, the parasympathetic nervous system is firing to the arteries in the penis and they dilate. They undergo vasodilation. So it causes more blood to rush into the penis, which compresses the veins and prevents the blood from leaving the penis for a short time. And that causes the erection. So what are the erectile tissues? Well, there's something called the corpus spongiosum. The corpus spongiosum is the erectile tissue that encircles the urethra directly. It's the deep erectile tissue that goes around the urethra and forms the head of the penis, which is called the glans penis. It's called the corpus spongiosum. So in the penis, we only have that one corpus spongiosum. However, there are two bands of erectile tissue on the top of the penis, which is called the dorsum of the penis. And those two bands of erectile tissue are called the corpus cavernosum or the corpora cavernosa would be plural since we have two of them, right? So these are the erectile tissues in the penis and you'll see them on the model, right? They're gonna fill with blood, cause the penis to become erect because of a parasympathetic reflex. Now, ejaculation is different. Ejaculation is caused by the sympathetic nervous system, which induces smooth muscle to contract around the vas deferens, which moves the sperm through the tubes that I already mentioned, and then eventually out of the male reproductive system out of the urethra and then out of the penis to be delivered into the female. Ultimately, if there's an egg been ovulated, fertilization may take place, which I'm gonna tell you where fertilization takes place in a minute. All right, now let's see uh, what I want you to know from here. All right, so the ductus vas deferens, this is a continuation of just those tubes. The next little paragraph I want you to concentrate on is this one, the reproductive glands. I know I have a couple of questions concerning the, the secretory products from these glands and everything you need to know is in this little paragraph. So I'm gonna show you what they are. So the seminal vesicles are the largest of the male reproductive glands and they're paired. There's two side by side. They lie on the posterior part of the bladder and as and they connect to the vas deferens at what's called the ampulla of the vas deferens. So these glands at, during the male orgasm are going to secrete about two thirds of the volume of the entire ejaculate, the volume. And that secretion from the seminal vesicles contains these substances right here. Now, I want you to know what is being secreted. I'm not gonna ask you the functions of everything, but I'll mention a couple of them now. Fructose is a sugar that's secreted from the seminal vesicles and it becomes a fuel source for ATP production. Remember, the sperm cells have to swim. That means they need fuel in the form of ATP. So that becomes a fuel source. Then there's mucus and buffers, alkaline buffers that are secreted. These alkaline buffers help raise the pH as the sperm cells are gonna be moving through the urethra. The last thing that, the last substance that comes through the urethra prior to ejaculation is urine. And urine is very acidic, which can damage sperm cells. Also, the inside of the vaginal canal is acidic. So this helps raise the pH around the sperm cells to protect them. So that acid environment does not hurt them. There's also these clotting proteins that helps coagulate everything together to keep the sperm in a little packet that's neatly deposited into the female reproductive tract. So it kind of clots together. So I want you to know that these substances are secreted by the seminal vesicles. 
Now there's a single gland, it's not paired, it's a single gland called the prostate gland. This is the one people hear about, especially when men get older and they have trouble urinating. The prostate enlarges and compresses on the, u the urethra and they have a hard time going to the bathroom because this gland circles around the urethra just beneath the urinary bladder. So as it gets larger in some older males, it compresses the urethra and the male can't empty the bladder all the way. But nonetheless, it's a single donut shaped gland and it secretes about one third of the seminal fluid. So the secretion from the prostate gland includes citric acid, some enzymes called proteolytic enzymes, kininogens, and prostaglandins. Now I know in here it says, see your textbook for the functions. I'm not gonna ask you the functions, but I still would like for you to know the names of these substances that are coming from the prostate gland, right? Technically these proteolytic enzymes are involved in helping break down the clot proteins once the ejaculate is in the female reproductive tract. Now, interestingly enough, when the male um, is sexually aroused, the prostate gland actually does enlarge. It swells up during sexual arousal. And since it surrounds the urethra, it blocks off the very superior portion of the urethra so that a male is unable to urinate at the same time that the ejaculate is moving out of the body during male orgasm. So this prevents urine from being emptied out of the bladder while the male is ejaculating. It swells around the urethra. Mr. Russell. Go ahead. Can you repeat that again? I understand what you said that it enlarges, but you had explained something right before it about why it enlarges, blocking or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. In older males, see, there's uh, differences in hormones and proteins that some proteins that can be made. Um, and one of them is called PS1. And they, they check for that. It's a prostate protein. And it, when it's at high concentrations, it's indicative that the prostate has enlarged. Now, when the prostate is enlarging in older males, it could be benign, meaning that it's not cancerous, or it may be enlarging because it is cancerous. And basically a tumor has formed in the prostate. So that's a little bit different as a male ages, that's different from what I'm talking about here. This is the enlargement of the prostate during sexual arousal is a temporary enlargement because it swells up with fluid as it's gonna secrete its product into the urethra. And one of its roles is to seal off the very top part of that urethra so the male cannot urinate. Now, in an older male, even when the older male, and not all males have the problem, it's only in some males, but as the male gets older in some of them, the prostate can enlarge even without being sexually aroused and it stays enlarged until they get put on medicine that can decrease the size of the prostate. Or in some cases, they have to have what's called a prostectomy. That's where the prostate is surgically removed if the problem persists really, really in a severe case. So in that situation, the prostate stays swollen and compresses the urethra and a male has a hard time voiding the bladder, going to the bathroom. Does that make sense now? Yes, sir, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All right, so the last glands that we have to talk about with the male are called the Cowper's glands. The other, the other name for them are called the bulbo urethral glands. So both names are good. You can put either one when you're doing the practical. I know both of the names, all right? So these glands are actually paired. They're, they're fairly small little glands that lie just beneath the prostate. And really the area was called the urogenital diaphragm on either side of the urethra. Now, the interesting thing about these glands, they secrete this alkaline buffer and mucousy secretion just prior to male orgasm. 
So just prior to ejaculation, these glands secrete a clear, viscous, mucousy, lubricating secretion that has these alkaline buffers in it into the urethra. And it serves two purposes. This, the secretions from these glands is often, in a layman's terms, what people would call the precum. And so it's just that clear, viscousy fluid that's coming through the urethra. Now that mucousy secretion is there for two reasons. One, it's going to lubricate the urethra, which prevents mechanical damage to the sperm cells as the ejaculate is being forced through the urethra. So those muscle contractions are so forceful that ejaculate is being powered through the urethra at a high rate of speed. And if there was no lubrication there in the urethra, the friction alone could damage the sperm cells. So basically it's a lubricant. Number two, again, the last thing that came through the urethra before ejaculation is urine and urine is acidic. So we have to take and raise the pH of the urethra up as, as so that the, the sperm cells are not damaged from the acid environment. So that's why there's alkaline buffers in there. So that's what those glands do, all right? So just review that little bit of information about the glands in that paragraph. All right. Um, All right, let's talk about the sperm cell just a little bit. I think there is a model of the sperm cell you have to identify. So I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about it. Um, sperm cells have a head region where the nucleus is located with the 23 chromosomes in it, just called the head region. The nucleus is actually called a pronucleus because there's only 23 chromosomes in it. But there's also an area on the very top of that little head piece region of the sperm cell called the acrosome. And the acrosome contains enzymes like hyaluronidase and proteases. Hyaluronidase and proteases are enzymes that are required to pen for the sperm to penetrate the egg. So the egg actually has these layers of proteins and, and sugars around it that protect the egg. And so the sperm actually has to bore a hole through those layers. And they do so, and they do so through what's called the acrosomal reaction. And so when the sperm reaches the egg, the acrosome releases these enzymes. And so the sperm can penetrate the outer layers of the egg so that fertilization can take place, all right? Now there is a midpiece region on the sperm just behind the head region, there's this midpiece region that contains the mitochondria. As you know, mitochondria are involved in making ATP. So there's a lot of mitochondria in that midpiece region. And behind the midpiece region, um, hold on one second, guys. Hold on one second. Let me pause this, finish this up. All right, so we left off with, this, with the sperm cells and really in semen. Semen is a collection of fluid from all the glands we just talked about and the sperm cells or spermatozoa. Now, I'm not going to ask you in particular, you might have a couple of this, these numbers on the tet, the practical, but, you know, I'm going to be a little forgiving with it. Just, a, just some basic numbers. The volume of the ejaculate can be from anywhere from two and a half to five milliliters give or take, and the pH has to be a high P, uh, in this range, 7.2 to 7.7, .7, which is somewhat of a high pH relative to urine. And that's why we have to buffer, have those buffers being secreted uh, to uh, raise the pH in the urethra for the sperm cells. And every milliliter, um, the sperm count can be 50 to 100 million sperm cells. That's a, I mean, that's a lot, right? In one mil. So it's it, pretty good uh, number of sperm cells. And technically it takes 
a whole bunch of sperm cells to fertilize one egg anyway. It's not just one sperm. It's a whole bunch of them that have to really go to the egg before one can fertilize it. All right, now we need to talk about the female reproductive system and really get into um, the female reproductive cycle, all right? So again, at puberty, preteens into the teen age, girls kind of go through puberty a little bit earlier than men, um, is when the female will start the regular repeating female reproductive cycle, all right? So that involves changes in the ovaries and in the uterus. And the average female reproductive cycle lasts for about 28 days. So the gist of the physiology that we're about to go over deals with the changes that occur with the ovaries and the uterus, all controlled by hormones, over the course of these 28 days. So as far as the primary organs are concerned, where the, where the eggs are produced, obviously in the ovaries, right? The secondary sexual organs include the vagina and the uterus. The vagina is going to receive the sperm cells, really the, the ejaculate. But it's also when the baby's born, it, the baby has to go through that vaginal canal. The uterus is where the baby is going to develop, obviously. The uterine tubes or the fallopian tubes carries the egg cell from the ovaries down to the uterus. And then the mammary glands on the breast produce milk for the baby to eat, right? And then there are some glands. We have what's called the paraurethral glands and the greater vestibular glands, which uh, produce lubrication during sexual intercourse. Again, secondary sexual characteristics are going to be the changes in the body that are indicative of females. So in females, there's different fat distribution patterns in the body, hair distribution patterns different from the males, as we all know, development of the breast and the pelvic girdle actually widens in a sexually mature female, right? Now, as far as the external genitalia are concerned, that the external genitalia are referred to as the vulva. The vulva or the other term pudendum, most students just put vulva, right? Which consists of several things. One, the area just above the labial folds in the pubic region is called the mons pubis. So this is where the pubic, you would find the pubic hair just above the labial folds um, and the clitoris, right? So there are two pair of labial folds, something called the labia majora. Those are the ones on the outside, pair uh, folds on the outside, and the inner folds, which are called the labia minora. Um, the clitoris lies superiorly to the labia minora. And then there's something called the vestibule. The vestibule is the area where you would find the opening of the vaginal canal and on either side of it, there are the greater vestibular glands that run in the shape of a V through the area of the pudendum or the vulva. So that's what we call the external genitalia of the female, right? You'll be identifying the clitoris and the labia major and the labia minora, uh, the vaginal orifice, the vaginal canal, all of that on a model, right? All right, now, as far as the ovaries and the uterus are concerned, we're gonna talk about some of the changes that occur cyclically over the course of the reproductive years of the female. So before I can do that, I have to go over some of this terminology in the anatomy of the ovary. So the ovaries are the site where the eggs will develop and the production of the eggs is called oogenesis. Just like the production of sperm is called spermatogenesis, eggs are produced via oogenesis. So not only are the eggs being produced and developing in the ovary, the ovaries are also involved in the production of the sexual hormones, estrogen, progesterone, 
are the ones that we're most, most familiar with. And, but also we have relaxin and inhibin. These two hormones, relaxin, ultimately at the time when a female is going to give birth to a baby, relaxin increases in concentration to allow the pubic symphysis that you learned about in AMP1 becomes more flexible. So the baby can be passed down through the birth canal more easily. Inhibin is a hormone that helps control the secretion of estrogens and progesterones, right? Now, the ovary contains a cortex region, which is the outer layer, the cortical layer. And then there's an inner layer called the medulla. The follicles are the fluid filled structures that will contain the cells that produce the egg cells, which are called oocytes, right? Now, prior to the birth of a baby female, the follicles are called primordial follicles. They're really, really small. These primordial follicles begin to develop and the little oocyte inside of it called an oogonium cell will begin meiosis. Remember meiosis is the production of the gametes. However, at around the time of birth, all of the meiotic processes in these primordial follicles stop and are halted in the first phase of meiosis called prophase one. So all during the childhood of the little female, the little girl, those, the ovaries are pretty much silent. The oocytes are not developing. However, at puberty, these cells in the follicles begin to complete meiosis to make the, the egg cell, the oocyte. Only, typically only one of the follicles continues to grow to allow only one egg to develop. However, some females are multi-ovulators. So sometimes more than one follicle can develop and complete the maturation of the egg cell, the oocyte, right? Now that process occurs over the course of 28 days right? And then if the female is not pregnant, the female undergoes menstruation. When she menstruates, that sloughs off the inside of the uterus, which we have to talk about the uterine changes in a minute. So during those 28 days, the ovaries are going to undergo developmental changes, cyclical developmental changes, and the uterus will undergo cyclical developmental changes, right? Um, only during the reproductive years. So as a female approaches the older ages where she's going to enter menopause, from menopause on, the female ovaries stop making hormones and stop producing eggs. So the female is no longer able to reproduce. That's everybody kind of knows that, right? So the ovaries are going to undergo some changes. I'm going to show you that on a picture. Um, and how the follicles are going to be developing over the course of 28 days. Now, now the ovaries are not directly attached to the uterus. <clears throat> well, they are attached to the uterus, but via a ligament. The fallopian tubes are not directly attached to the ovary. They actually hover over the top of the ovary. So the fallopian tubes are the tubes that will draw in a egg, a mature egg called the ovum during ovulation and sweep that mature egg into the tube, also called a uterine tube or fallopian tube. These tubes are lined by a ciliated simple columnar epithelial tissue. So the cilia beat creating a downward current of fluid that always goes down the tube towards the uterus. So the uterine tube transports that egg down towards the uterus once a month. Now, if there are sperm cells present in a female reproductive tract, the sperm cells actually typically reach the, the 
the ovulated egg inside the fallopian tube. So fertilization typically takes place in the fallopian tube. Now, once the sperm fertilizes the egg in the fallopian tube, it forms a zygote. That single cell then divides over and over and over and over as it's being passed down the fallopian tube. So by the time it reaches the inside of the uterus, it's a little bitty ball of a mass of cells. That little bitty ball of cells implants on the uterus and that's where the placental tissues will develop and obviously where the baby will develop on the inside of the uterus. So the process by which the egg gets fertilized and then goes to implanting on the inside of the uterus typically takes about five days, right? For implantation to occur. Now, the uterus itself has different layers to it. The very middle layer of the uterus is the muscle layer. There's smooth muscle in there. And it's called the myometrium. You're going to see that on a model. That muscle tissue is the muscle tissue that will contract when the female is in labor, ultimately to help deliver the baby. It's called the myometrium. The very inner layer of the uterus, the inside of the uterus, is called the endometrium. The endometrium has two main layers to it. They're called stratum something. So the innermost layer of the endometrium is called the stratum basilis. And the outermost layer that faces the inside of the uterus is called the stratum functionalis. The stratum functionalis is the layer that is sloughed off once a month and becomes the menses in a non-pregnant female. And I'm gonna show you that as well, all right? Now, let's look at, um, oh, here's, I want you to look at this paragraph right here just for the glands, the periurethral glands also called the Skeen's glands, just review that. The greater vestibular glands are also called the Bartholin glands, right? So I want you to review these two glands in this paragraph. What I want to do now is go over the female reproductive cycle with you. There's going to be several questions from the female reproductive cycle. All right. So the female reproductive cycle involves changes in both the ovaries and in the uterus that occur cyclically once a month, unless the female is pregnant. In a non-pregnant female, the female will go through the cycle and these changes, which are all controlled by the sexual hormones. So that's going to include some hormones from the hypothalamus and the pituitary that we learned about a long time ago in the endocrine chapter, and hormones from the ovary itself. So ultimately, we're going to split the female reproductive cycle up into what we call the ovarian cycle, and into what we call the uterine or menstrual cycle. I typically just call it the uterine cycle. Collectively together, both of these cycles make up the female reproductive cycle, all right? So let's look at this for a second. In the ovary, the first part of the ovarian cycle is called the follicular phase or the preovulatory phase. Obviously, that means all the changes that will occur in the ovary before ovulation. It occurs the, in the first 13 days of the 28-day cycle, right? So I'm going to describe to you what's going on from a picture in a second with this first phase. Then on the 14th day of a regular 28-day cycle, and I get it, there's many women that are not regular 28-day females. But just for textbook purposes, it's based on the average of 28 days. So on that 14th day, right in the middle, we just call that ovulation. That means the egg cell is going to be released from the ovary and get swept up into the fallopian tube. So on that 14th day, we just call that ovulation. After ovulation, it's called the luteal 
phase or post ovulatory phase. And that phase lasts the last 14 days of the cycle, all the way from day 15 to day 28, right? So those are the names of the phases and the days that they occur in. I want you to know that. I'm gonna tell you what's in these little paragraphs off of the picture. So I'm gonna describe to you exactly what's going on with the changes in a second. As far as the changes of the uterus are concerned, the very first five days of the cycle for the uterine cycle, and all this is occurring at the same time during these 28 days. The first five days for the uterine cycle is the menstrual period, the menstrual phase. So that's the inside of the stratum functionalis, the endometrium, the stratum functionalis being shed. And that's what comes out as the menses over the course of the first five days. After that, day six through 13 is called the proliferative phase, six through 13. Then again, on that 14th day of the regular 28 days is just ovulation again, and no major changes occur in the uterus during that day 14. After ovulation, dealing with the uterine changes only is called the secretory phase and is the last all the way from 15 to the last day, the 28th day. So you need to know the names of the phases and what they're characterized as, which I'm about to go over, and then the days that they exist in, all right? And then some of the, a, a little bit about the hormones that are causing these changes to occur. So we can learn pretty much everything we need to know off of this simple picture. I know it doesn't look simple to you yet, but after I describe it, maybe it will. So we have here what's called the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis. That's what we call this. This represents the follicles in the ovary. So this is, would be all the changes that occur in the ovary over the course of the 28 days. Down at the bottom represents the changes that will occur in the uterus over the course of those 28 days. So the very top part of the picture is what we call the ovarian cycle and the bottom is the uterine cycle, right? So ultimately, just prior to what females think is that first day, that menstruation is the first day of the cycle, just prior to that, towards the end of a previous cycle, some of the follicles are receiving follicle-stimulating hormones. Follicle stimulating hormone from the anterior, remember the gonadotrophs and the anterior pituitary gland? They produce follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. But the gonadotrophs only produce those in response to this hypothalamic hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone. So, gonadotropin releasing hormone causes the gonadotrophs to release follicle stimulating hormone. It does exactly what the name implies. It stimulates the follicles to begin to grow and develop. So over the first 13 days of the female cycle, this is called the follicular phase. It's called the follicular phase because the follicles are growing. That's an easy way you could think of it. So what happens during this phase? Well, follicle stimulating hormone is causing the follicles to grow allowing the oocyte to undergo meiosis to develop into the egg that will ultimately be ovulated, right? Now, during this time, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone is also going to cause special cells of the follicle to produce estrogen. So before ovulation, the ovaries produce estrogen from the growing follicles. That's different after ovulation. So during the pre-ovulatory phase, estrogens come from the follicles. Now, estrogens are going to be important for the changes that occur in the uterus, as well as progesterone in a minute. So estrogens ultimately will begin to allow the uterus to grow the stratum functionalis after menstruation is completed. 
So over the course of the first five days of the uterine cycle, the menstrual flow is coming out. Basically, that is a shedding of the dead layers of what's called the stratum functionalis of the endometrium. So once it's shed, the thickness of the inside of the uterus, the endometrium is thin. So the main changes that occur inside the uterus during the uterine cycle is that the stratum functionalis of the endometrium gets thicker. It grows and grows and grows. So that happens during the proliferative phase, growing and growing and growing and growing, getting thicker, getting thicker, right, for the uterine cycle. So from day five all the way to day 13 is the proliferative phase. Now on that day 14, that's ovulation. So no major changes in the uterus, but look what happens up here at the ovary. During this time in the pre-ovulatory or follicular phases, the follicles begin to grow, several of them. But in a typical female, only the largest of the follicles that have begun to, to grow continue to grow. The smaller ones die off. They're actually called an atretic follicle because they get reabsorbed by the ovary. So typically only one of the follicles continues to grow big and the egg cell is still developing inside of that one. So the most mature follicle contains a cell that is ovulated called the secondary oocyte. That's what's ovulated once a month on that 14th day. It's called a secondary oocyte. So what causes this follicle to rupture open and release this egg, the secondary oocyte. Well, luteinizing hormone. So luteinizing hormone's job is to still get the follicles to make hormones, estrogen, pre-ovulatory, progesterone and estrogen post-ovulatory. But another one of its main roles is that within 24 hours prior to ovulation, Luteinizing hormone increases drastically in concentration in the blood. That's called, that's called the LH spike. So the LH or luteinizing hormone increases in concentration and that increase in concentration causes the mature graphene follicle to rupture open, releases this egg cell, which is actually an immature egg. It's not even a mature egg yet because it hasn't completed meiosis two yet. But nonetheless, this secondary oocyte will be swept up into the fallopian tube. And if sperm cells are present, again, that's where fertilization typically takes place. And once that is happening, this secondary oocyte will complete meiosis two to form the mature ovum, the mature egg. And then a sperm cell can fertilize it. So what happens after day 14, as far as the ovary is concerned? Well, from day 15 to day 28 in the ovarian cycle is referred to as the luteal phase. It's called the luteal phase because this ruptured open follicle, graphene follicle, is going to develop into this gland called the corpus luteum. So let me show you what happens right here. I forgot to mention this. Once this graphene mature follicle ruptures open, it forms a wound at the surface of the ovary and of the follicle. So it forms a little blood clot in here. And so we call that ruptured follicle that released the egg, the corpus hemorrhagicum. So this primordial follicle develops into a primary follicle, which develops into a secondary follicle. The whole time this egg is undergoing meiosis and developing, that turns into the mature graphene follicle, which ruptures open. The ruptured open graphene follicle is now called the corpus hemorrhagicum. The corpus hemorrhagicum heals up. It heals up and the cells along the perimeter of the follicle grow and get really big and it turns into what's called the corpus luteum. So from day uh, 15 to day 28, the corpus luteum is developing and is developed. 
and it is the structure that produces estrogen and progesterone post-ovulatory. So from the ovary, estrogens and progesterones come from the corpus luteum after ovulation. Estrogens come from the follicle before ovulation. So the corpus luteum is a gland that used to be the follicle. It produces progesterones and estrogens. Now, after ovulation for the uterus, that's called the secretory phase, ultimately because there's a barrage of progesterone and estrogens that's going to continue to allow the uterus to thicken up, get thick. That is necessary for the potential implantation of the fertilized egg, the thickness of the stratum functionalis, right? Now, in a non-pregnant female, the, the corpus luteum will die. It only stays viable for about two weeks, which is pretty much the end of the regular cycle. So in a non-pregnant female, the corpus luteum dies and becomes scar tissue, which then builds up in the ovary a little bit at a time, and it's called the corpus albicans. So what you're looking at here is a progression of uh, generation and degeneration of follicles. Primordial follicle becomes a primary follicle, which becomes a secondary follicle, which becomes a mature graphene follicle, which ruptures open to release the egg at ovulation and develops into the corpus hemorrhagicum. The corpus hemorrhagicum develops into the corpus luteum, which produces the hormones post-ovulatory. After two weeks, if the female is not pregnant, the corpus luteum dies and becomes the corpus albicans. Now, in the absence of a viable corpus luteum, progesterone and estrogen levels drop drastically at the end of a cycle. In the absence of progesterone predominantly, these spiral arteries in the, in the endometrium die. So the blood supply to the stratum functionalis dies, and that's what makes this tissue die. The very inner layer of the endometrium actually dies off when these hormones are real, real low. And this is what becomes the menstruation, the menses for the next cycle. So that's in a non-pregnant female. We'll go through that cycle all over again over here. Now, what happens in a pregnant female? Well, when a female is pregnant, you guys know about the home pregnancy test. You go get a home pregnancy test, you test and it's either, you know, oh, it's positive, so I'm pregnant or it's negative, right? Everybody knows that. But what are you really testing for? Well, you're testing for a hormone that's only produced when the female is pregnant. It's called human chorionic gonadotropic hormone. That hormone is produced when the female, when the sperm fertilizes an egg and its role is to maintain the life of the corpus luteum for about one more week Oh, about a week longer than it would normally live. <coughs> Excuse me. So that it will continuously produce progesterone and estrogens until the egg is implanted in the uterus, the fertilized egg, the zygote. Well, technically at implantation, it's a little ball of cells at that point. But when, the, when that blastula is implanting in the uterus, the cells that will form the placenta begin to take over the job of producing estrogens and progesterones. So ultimately, the corpus luteum will die anyway. So during pregnancy, the hormones are coming from the tissues in, that are formed by the, that form the placenta. And that way, progesterone stays high during pregnancy. Estro estrogen is staying high during pregnancy. And these hormones, progesterone and estrogens, is what maintains the thickness of the uterus. So in a pregnant female, these hormones have to stay high. In a non-pregnant female, the corpus luteum dies, so it stops making these hormones. So the hormone levels drop, the stratum functionalis dies and becomes the menses of the next cycle. Pretty interesting, huh? 
All right, so that's the female reproductive cycle. You can see here at the bottom when the hormones increase and when they drop off. So just to show you real quick, follicle stimulating hormone goes up and we start, the follicles start to develop, right? Luteinizing hormone goes up a little bit, but not too much. And then just before ovulation on day 14, about 24 hours to 48 hours before, it spikes. And this is what causes ovulation. Estrogens are on the rise just before ovulation because the follicles are being stimulated to grow and they produce estrogen. Follicle stimulating hormone are stimulating them. So they start making estrogen at a higher concentration. So we see that go up. All of a sudden, the follicle ruptures open, estrogen drops a little bit until the corpus luteum develops, and estrogen will go up some, but predominantly progesterone. So this progesterone increase is what maintains the life of the stratum functionalis. When it, when it drops off in concentration, the stratum functionalis is going to die and becomes the menses of the next cycle. All right, so before I stop sharing that, does anybody have any questions about this cycle for me? All right, very good. Let me <clears throat> pull up this real quick. Oh, I didn't put that in there. Oh, I didn't put the link for the reproductive models, but it's, it is in, I mean, the Quizlet. Where's the Quizlet link at? Here it is. You can access everything from the Quizlet link. You just have to go to the front end of it, I think. Let me see, let me go back. I'm gonna have to find that link and put it in there. I didn't realize I didn't have it in there. Nobody emailed me to tell me that. I do have it down here at the bottom. So at the bottom where it says the whole Quizlet class, you can click on that. Why does it look like this? How do we get out of this view? Let me go over here. Somebody must be posting stuff in my Quizlet. I don't know what all of that is. All right, folders, here we go. Reproductive folders. All right, let's look at the ovary for a second. All right, so here's the ovary model you're gonna be learning right? Um, you have to identify all these different structures on here. But what I really wanted to go over is show you these, the changes in the follicles here. So you know what you're looking at. So over here, this number four is pointed to these primordial follicles. These are what are going to develop into the uh, primary follicle. So we go from primordial follicle to primary follicle to secondary follicle. See how it's getting a little bit bigger? Now this one right here, number six, that's called an atretic follicle. That's what I mentioned earlier. An atretic follicle is a follicle that's dying and being reabsorbed by the ovary because only the largest of the follicles will continue to grow. The secondary follicle then becomes the mature graphene follicle, this big thing right here. And this one is actually in the middle of rupturing open, whoops, sorry, to release this little egg cell right here. That little bitty ball is the egg cell that is ovulated. It's called the secondary oocyte. Now, once this, is, this secondary oocyte is ovulated, there's a little wound at the top of the ovary. This mature graphene follicle becomes this corpus uh, hemorrhagicum over here. So this number three is pointing to what's called the corpus hemorrhagicum. And you could tell that because, well, you can't really tell right here, but when you look at the model a little bit closer, 
It's almost like there's a little bit of blood in there. So it's a corpus hemorrhagicum. So this structure, the cells of this structure are going, it's all going to heal up. These cells are going to develop into this structure. This is called the corpus luteum. This is what produces estrogen and progesterones post ovulatory, but it only lasts for about two weeks. And ultimately it will die and become this gray tissue in here. This tissue, this tissue, and this tissue right here is all the same. The little gray looking tissue is scar tissue. That those are remnants of developed follicles into corpus luteum that dies. It's called the corpus albicans, right? So that just, this model just shows the cyclical changes of the, the follicles. All right, um, I wanted to show you the testicle. I, I don't know if they're gonna use my slide or not, probably not, but the testicle all looks the same. If you take a cross section through the testicle, you see a whole bunch of little tubes in here. Now enlarged, you can see them a little bit, a little bit better. And then here's the largest magnification. So this is called a seminiferous tubule. This is where the sperm cells are gonna be produced inside these tubes. The cells that lie on the outside of the tube are called the interstitial endocrinocytes or the interstitial cells of Leydig. Those are the cells that produce testosterone, right? All right, um, so these are all the models I want you to start reviewing. You could do that throughout today and over the course of the next day or so. If you have any questions about them, all you have to do is email me to let me know that you have some questions.